you, Ashlyn. That's really great. And thanks for joining us. I'm very excited to do this. Um, I gave a, I, I, we played a recording that I did a while back that's on the ICSA website. And as Ashlyn says, there were so many questions and I just thought it would be a good idea if anyone's interested to, to do this again. And so, um, and there seem to be a lot of questions about trauma, although the talk wasn't about trauma. And um, I've been doing some writing and thinking about how I want to kind of formulate ideas around trauma for former members. So I'm trying it out on you guys. So um, feedback would be great. Anything, you know, that I need to tweak, whatever. So let's see. So. I called it what helps former cult members recover and that's because I'm actually a former cult member and I'm also a psychotherapist and I specialize in working with former cult members so I only work with former cult members now and um, I've developed an approach to counseling former members called post cult counseling and um, it's really a psychoeducation, so relational psychoeducation, I call it. So really there's a big psychoeducational aspect to it. And one of the aspects is trauma. So there's stuff about me online. So you can, if you don't know who I am, you can easily find out. So I'm gonna get on. So I want to just make it clear that this isn't a therapy session. This is a psychoeducational session. Um, okay. So I'm going to just go through a whole lot of stuff. I'll tell you a little bit more about myself and then I'll give you a bit of a context to why I'm talking about trauma in, in relation to cult recovery. And then I'm going to look at what is an introject. So I'm going to go over that quickly. It's also in the other talk I did. I'm going to talk about what is trauma, complex PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm going to talk about big T traumas and little t traumas. I'm going to talk about the zones. I'll tell you about that. Neuroception, pattern matches, zone shifts and grounding. So some of these words will be new to you. They're but some of them are fairly new to me. I've been really studying up on this stuff. So obviously we're doing this because of this awful pandemic and, you know, the sense of present danger for all of us, you know, I'm 67. And so I just sit into the, uh, the, the group of people who are over 65, who, you know, there's, a higher level of danger or they thought that at the beginning it, it seems like it's not exactly like that anymore but that awful feeling of being very vulnerable and you know not knowing what the outcome of this all might be for me and and then that sense of present danger kind of merging with past danger that I felt and I think this is very relevant for, for those of us who've had trauma in the past. So, and the other thing is, like we've been in lockdown now for maybe three weeks, um, might be a little bit longer for us as older people. And it's beginning to wear a bit thin, isn't it? It's like, oh, you know, um, there was an interesting thing on my Facebook page about people reporting really vivid dreams about bugs and weird things and just this sense. I, I've had dreams about people coming too close to me and sort of aware of my own anxiety about that. And, and then this other thing of people longing, you know, oh, I just want to stand on grass. A friend of mine said the other day, he lives in a very concrete built up area and someone else, I just want to go to the pub you know just the usual things so we're missing stuff and we're feeling scared a lot of us I think probably the whole world is having such a similar experience and that's very very unusual so I've said a little bit about myself already but I am a former member and when I 
left the cult back in 1995, I actually decided to train as a therapist because there really were no therapists around um, to work with former members. There were lots of therapists, but none who understood. And so I'd been on a kind of 25 year journey to develop services. I did a PhD where I asked former cult members, what do you think helps former members recover? And so this theory and all of this comes out of my own personal experience, working as a therapist with former members and then out of research. So I hope it makes sense to you. I hope it's helpful to you. That's the main reason I'm doing this. So I just want to give you a little bit of um, kind of a little quick background. I, I have this idea of a this metaphor of a, a jigsaw that that um, when we're in a cult, we have to we have to become the person that we're expected to be in that cult. And I, I talked in the other talk about the pseudo personality, that cult personality. And I kind of picture the, the overlaying of our authentic self with the cult personality as like pieces of a jigsaw because each piece of the jigsaw is a psychoeducational area. Um, I hope that makes some sense. <laughs> but what we need to learn in order to, to recover is to unlayer that pseudo identity and look at each piece of the jigsaw so that we can recover and come back to our, our authentic identity. And trauma is one piece of that jigsaw. And the whole point behind this is we need to understand the dynamics of, of the cult. We need to understand how they did what they did to us. And, and that's where the psychoeducation comes in. So the, the, it needs to be relational as well. We heal in relationship, actually, but we need both relationship and we need psychoeducation. And truly do believe now, and I think there's a lot of evidence now from my own work and other people's that ordinary therapy is not enough for former cult members we need this psychoeducation okay so i'm going to start so the you can see on the side of the slide is it's like two hands with the pieces of the jigsaw that's where i'm looking at the psychoeducational stuff and i'm just going to go over this again that an intraject so i this idea is very helpful in working through our cult issue and an introject an introject is something a belief or behavior which you've taken into yourself that is sitting in your psychological system like a piece of unchewed or undigested food in your gut so it, we're unable to chew over what we were told or what happened to us within the cult and so it sits in us and causes discomfort I'm just moving this. I've got the video thing over in the wrong place, so I can't read the slide. So, so it causes us discomfort because it sits in our gut and it doesn't, um, we haven't chewed it over. So, and one way of recognizing introjects is should or ought. So you can just, you can think about that later. This is being recorded. You can see this later or see the other um, slide, the other sh um, presentation, sorry, that I did. So if we have something in our gut, something we haven't chewed over, we need to chew it over. We need to chew over the beliefs and the behaviours that, that um, we had bought into in, in the group and we need to challenge those introjects. And you know, we need to remember this, I think, throughout the post-cult journey. They come up all the time in projects. So I'm going to move on now to, to what is trauma. And this is a great quote from um, an amazing lady called Carolyn Spring, who's a survivor of severe abuse and is now a trainer in the UK. And she's doing quite a lot of reduced cost training and things. And you can check her out online. But she said, and this is really from personal experience, that trauma isn't, sorry, excuse me, 
Trauma isn't just about being upset by something bad having happened to us. Trauma is a supremely physical phenomenon where all sorts of things happen in the body at the moment of trauma. And when that trauma happens again and again, it is no wonder that the impact of those physical changes adds up. So I think this is really important that trauma is a very physical experience and I imagine many of you can relate to that. So I looked up what does the word trauma mean and in fact it's Greek for wound which makes a lot of sense doesn't it? And that wound can be physical, psychological, it can be individual but also we experience it in groups. So um, Rebecca stopped uh, wrote a book about her experience. Uh, it's called A Father, a Daughter and a Cult. And she was interviewed in The Guardian and she said actually they suffered group trauma. And I thought that was a really interesting insight that, that all the people in the group were also experiencing trauma with and from one another. And then right now, globally, we're suffering trauma. You know, we all are suffering a, a reaction and fear and uncertainty and loss of our jobs, you know, and things like that. So, so, you know, that's kind of what it means. So, and, you know, the other thing is that being so restricted and constrained at the moment, this, this can really remind us of other restrictions and constraints. When I was in my group, um, I was very psychologically constrained. I never thought about leaving. Um, I just thought I had to endure this terrible experience. And so that can happen to us if we trigger. And the other thing is that, you know, we may be terrified that what we were told in the cult is actually coming true. And, you know, that this is actually a judgment or the end of the world. And that's a serious issue um, that's, uh, you know, I don't believe that. I think clearly that is nothing to do with it. It's a virus that's um, evolved and just been released into the world. But, you know, um, we have to really chew over because that's actually an introject. That's a very good example of an introject of believing something that needs chewing over. Come to your own decision about that. I don't think it's the judgment of God, but you have to make that decision for yourself. So, so these things can be triggered. And, and so I'm going to look at, you know, how to deal with this stuff. So I guess a lot of you have heard of complex post-traumatic stress disorder and um, PTSD, we talk about it quite commonly now. It's talked about in the paper and stuff and in newspapers, that sort of thing. And I, PTSD is actually a coverall term for many symptoms that an individual may experience. So these, the thing about symptoms is, is very important. And the symptoms can be anxiety, depression, loss of hope, helplessness, sadness, physical illness caused by traumatic stress in the body, and many more. There are many more symptoms. But, you know, the PTSD is sort of diagnosed by looking at these sorts of symptoms and when I was young I suffered a great deal of trauma we had a lot of very difficult things going on in my family I wasn't brought up in a cult thankfully it was bad enough uh, I can't you know I, I do try to imagine and, and understand what it is like to grow up in a very constrained and um, suppressive uh, cult but um, but I think, you know, I was actually undiagnosed with PTSD. I think I suffered PTSD probably a lot of my childhood and adolescence and nobody noticed. And, and so I kind of know this from the inside out. And then, you know, the cult experience on top of that has, you know, given me a very strong sense of what it's like. And it's very painful and very difficult suffering PTSD. And PTS, CPTSD, I'll just call it PTSD, develops in response to trauma. And it's when our 
a person's normal ability to cope has been completely overwhelmed by a terrible event. So it's just, we're just not coping anymore. We're overwhelmed. And um, there are other criteria, but we don't need to go into that. So how do you define a terrible event? What is a terrible event? So I, I really like this idea of uh, the two different types, which are big T, like big T traumas, you know, and then small T traumas, the little traumas. I'm going to say more about that. So a big T trauma is, is to me, it's like the obvious ones of, you know, psychological assault on the mind and emotional abuse, physical assault, sexual abuse for children and adults, death, and we're seeing so much of that around us. The big T trauma, pictures of New York on the news just before I started this talk, it's, you know, horrific. Serious illness, well, that's applicable. Natural disasters, so I put COVID in there, but, you know, all sorts of natural disasters, tsunamis, that sort of thing. And then this additional one for those of you who've been in cults, particularly bought those born and raised, this terror of, of actually what, you know, I think is an imagined natural dis disaster such as Armageddon, nuclear destruction in other types of groups. I've known people who believed the world was going to end and who moved to a cottage with lots of food, you know, that, that sort of thing, and then wondering why the world hadn't ended. You know what I mean, I know you do. So, so these are big T traumas. The other aspect of big T traumas, which is very applicable to those of you who are born and raised, is, is the attachment traumas. That traumas that occur because of our human relationships and particularly with those we're attached to. So, you know, our parents being more interested in the cult that, than us. And or someone else other than your parents bringing you up and they don't love you in the way a parent should love you. Often they can be harsh. I've heard many stories of many different things. And then of course, shunning is a massive big T trauma, uh, being rejected, left on your own. It's, it's huge, it's huge. And you know, can really sit in the system, sit in our body. So, now this is a more subtle one and is incredibly relevant as well for former cult members. The small T traumas. Then they, this person Shapiro and Silk Forest, these two, they said that it's an accumulation of emotional shocks that create substantial and lasting psychological damage. It's something that severely jars the mind or emotions. So it's really impactful but it's probably not recognized and i think like i'm obviously we can't interact here so you can interact a bit with the questions and answers but i was thinking about what were the small t traumas for me so within my group i mean we were terrified we didn't particularly think the world was going to end and there was physical punishment so that's a big t trauma but there was all all the time this kind of fear of the leader and his power and the belief that that god was backing him up and that you know god would always be on his side so whatever he did was right and it didn't matter whatever was happening to me the feeling of being out of control um being disciplined by others in the group, bullying, public shaming in group, you know, the kind of group confessions. These are really terrifying things being rebuked. You know, I remember for years after leaving the cult, if I got something wrong, I'd get this drop in my stomach of fear of, oh my God, I've, I've learned now to deal with the trigger and to think actually, maybe they're wrong or maybe it's not the end of the world that I got something wrong but you know when we're in those those that setting it's it's very very 
um, frightening. And these are all massive traumas that sit in our body and um, that can keep triggering off. So, you know, small T traumas add up and they can result in complex post-traumatic stress disorder. But I think, and this is where therapists who don't understand about cults can actually miss a whole load of stuff, is that these small T traumas can get minimized and they're not re necessarily recognized for being important. And, and just remember that PTSD is the coverall term for the symptoms that result from this. So, you know, the, the trauma happens and these horrible things happen within these abusive settings, but we're left with the symptoms and what, what's left with us. And, and that's the challenge. So I hope that's clear. And I'm sorry if it isn't. <laughs> so we can't use the chat and I didn't realize that. And I really see the point. We don't want people coming and being abusive in this setting. So, um, you know, I, I think, as I've said, former members suffer from both big T traumas and small T traumas. And, you know, you, you could reflect later if that's helpful to you about, you know, what were the small T traumas and what, what are there, what things are there that you may have dismissed or minimized or thought, well, that's silly or, you know, that isn't something when actually it, it really is something that needs to be attended to. So, okay, we go through these experiences. I went through seven years within this group called the love of god community uh, i've decided i avoid anything that says it loves me or it's safe for me or whatever you know it's like well maybe maybe not um so you know w once that trauma is over once we've left and we leave in so many different ways i know some of you i can guess you know how many difficult situations there might be that people have left people have been shunned people of um, first generation or those who join going back to family who don't understand have lost friends you know there's such a big job to do so how do we manage our reactions to the big t and small t traumas and how do we recover so you know we need to process our experiences and our emotions and i think one of the keys is learning to live where we feel safe enough I don't think anything is um, perfect. I, I like the idea of something being safe enough um, and not promising something, as I've said, about being perfectly safe. So, sorry, this is a, a bit of a, a lot of information, but what I want to, to do is talk you through this because this is really important. This um, diagram is, is actually describing how our bodies react to trauma and our autonomic nervous system. Very simple, actually, although it might look like a sensory overload. So at the top is what I call, I love this term, the window of tolerance. It's that zone where we feel safe enough. And I've made it green because I think green is a relaxing color. I hope it is to you. And within the window of tolerance, we can tolerate feelings, so we're not overwhelmed by them, and we can think and feel at the same time. So I can process information and memories. So I, I can process things, I'm not overwhelmed. But then you drop down into fight and flight, which you've probably all heard of, which is hyper arousal zone. And here we're in danger or we think we're in danger, and we become overwhelmed by feelings and sensations. And then if that becomes too much, we drop down even further into the freeze submit. So you see fight and flight is red, for the red of ah, and freeze submit is cold, it's, it's blue, and it's hypoarousal zone. And we can become, in this zone, we're overwhelmed by cues of extreme danger and terror. So it's, it's like really dangerous at this point. And we shut down our feelings and sensations so we don't move because we feel safe and not moving. And it's the freeze zone. And you've probably seen 
like I mentioned last time when we did the Q and A, um, the mouse freezing in the 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 mouth of the cat because the cat will be less interested if it plays dead, and this is what happens to our bodies and what happens to us. I'll say more. So. Just to reiterate, you had that picture. It's the window of tolerance. It's the feeling safe in our zone. We can tolerate feelings and think and feel at the same time and process information and memories. So we're in a different part of the brain. The fight and flight is the hyperarousal zone where we're in danger. Our body's saying, don't just sit there, do something. And we're like, oh, I've got to act. And in terms of the, the symptoms, the long term, I should have put symptoms there, are we're overwhelmed by feelings and sensations. We suffer with anxiety, panic, impulsivity. That is, we're impulsive. We don't think we might put ourselves in danger. We're hypervigilant, we're on, on the lookout all the time, who's gonna hurt me, what's gonna happen next. We're defensive, we can be quite grumpy and defensive with it. Um, we can feel unsafe, we can be reactive, it's like Rrr. We can have racing thoughts and we can have hot rage. Um, my friend and colleague Sue Parker Hall has written a book on anger, rage and relationship and she places hot rage as a defense against the impact of trauma and and actually a, our best way of surviving that trauma and it sits in fight and flight in the red zone and then the the freeze submit zone you know you can think of freezing and submitting i submitted so much in my cult and this is hypo arousal we're overwhelmed by cues of extreme danger and terror, shut down feelings and sensations so as not to move, and our body saying, don't move, it's not safe. And the long-term symptoms, and we can feel numb, feel dead, passive, no feelings, no energy, can't think, shut down, not there, feel ashamed, can't say no and cold rage, I missed that out, sorry Sue. Um, cold rage sits in, in this section. And if you, you, you know, I think reading online how people are feeling about COVID-19, I'm seeing some of this, I can't concentrate, I feel so tired, I'm not doing anything, but I feel so tired. I think, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, us going into the freeze, not submit necessarily, but freeze. So if you remember the first diagram, I put these, these are in zones. And so we actually move between these zones, but why do we move between the zones? And do we do it on purpose? Is it something I think, oh, I think I'm going to become hyper aroused? Well, clearly we don't. So this is a term, a scientific term, but it's really helpful, I think. And it, it's neuroception. The term neuroception is how we unconsciously read the environment. Okay. So our nervous system judges the situation and activates the best strategy for our survival. Okay. So that's incredible. You think actually, you know, we're, we're wired to keep ourselves safe and to survive. And somehow, there is a part of the brain that actually works to unconsciously read the environment, detect danger. And if we detect danger, we automatically shift from one zone to another. So it's out of our awareness. So you, I mean, I've often had this sensation of feeling right and then suddenly feeling really horrible and thinking, what's, what's happening? What's the matter? And, and, and I've learned now, I think, oh, okay. I, I'm either there's something I need to run away from, which then I can do that. But if if there isn't, then it's like, okay, I think I'm triggered. So we'll come to that. So neuroception is how we read the environment, as I say. And this is a quote from someone saying that neuroception is like the gut feelings, the heart informed feelings and the implicit feelings 
that move us along the continuum between safety and survival response. So the, the red zone and the blue zone are our survival response and safety is the green zone. So I like that, because that, we can relate to the sort of thing about gut feelings or I didn't feel good in my heart sort of thing or something didn't feel right um, or something did feel right. So the autonomic nervous system was the three zones, okay, in very, very simple, very simple picture of it. But it, it helps to track our nervous system between the zones. And some of us live outside this safe green zone in the window of tolerance, and we, we rarely feel safe enough. And I think that may be true for some people listening to this. And our bodies remain prepared for danger, even when there is none. And so we get triggered. And it's important, therefore, to be able to tell the difference between an actual danger and a trigger. And you see this trigger thing is like, I don't know if you, you can relate to the idea of a trigger. I'm sure you do. There's been a lot of uh, teaching about it in ICSA, but um, that actually it's a bit like stand, stepping on a landmine and you don't know it's there. And, and that's why I use this, this, diet, this picture of it. So this statement is very interesting at the top of this slide that after trauma the nervous system remains prepared for danger so our neuroception gets damaged due to trauma wounding that happened to me you know I, I it was so confusing everything was confusing I completely lost a sense of my authentic identity and I didn't know what was happening or you know just really confused so so it was damaged. It was hard for me to tell, am I in danger or am I not? And so, you know, for those of us that that's happened, we may live in the red zone of hyperarousal, or we may live in the blue zone on freeze and playing dead and being down and depressed and all those things, or we may move between zones. And that's actually a lot more likely that we will move between zones. So here's a, bit of a sense, another sensory overload, but I, I thought this would be a useful thing to present to you. That a trigger occurs when there's a pattern match. So when the present now, which is the yellow one, looks like the past then, or looks enough like the past, then there's a pattern match. So you can see these two pictures are the same but they're different colors one's bigger than the other but actually it's near enough to look like oh my goodness there's a pattern match and this is a really helpful idea I think and um, to actually say okay this pattern match this match of now to then actually is a trick has, has set off a trigger it's that, that I'm reminded now of what happened then and this is the trigger has set off. So triggers are, result of, are a result of reminders and remembering. And one of the things that can be a trigger is the loaded language from the cult. Now, I don't know if you understand that term, but loaded language is one of the eight components of thought reform. And in, I would say, all cults, the language there's this cliched language it's the cult's special short-term language and the trouble is that uh, it can be very triggering the loaded language um, when I left my bible-based group um, I found hearing the bible incredibly triggering because I couldn't separate any of what I might think about it from what I was told it meant and so it it was very triggering and that that landmine would go off if I heard it. Um, remember the thing about introjects, something you've taken into your system un, unchewed that sits undigested causing pain. Um, introjects are tri can be triggers, you know, believing the world's going to end and I've introjected that is clearly going to be a trigger if there's a pattern match to um, something I, I believe that's in the present. 
and then actually objects can be a pattern match. I remember someone coming to see me for counseling and I could see they froze when they came in the room and I, I managed to, luckily I saw that and I look out very carefully for that sort of thing. And I said, is everything okay in this environment? And they said to me that um, the, the cushion with tassels was reminding them of the, the meeting room from the cult. So I just simply got hold of the cushion. I said, would you like me to get rid of this and put it outside the door? Absolutely, we did that and they were fine and they settled back down into the window of tolerance and the safety zone, safe enough zone. So a person can obviously be a trigger, a place, a memory, a picture, a smell, a taste, a sound, a physical feeling. So even our bodies can cause us to trigger a sensation, an emotion. So it's, there's lots of things that can be triggering for us and can be symptoms of memories, or, or, you know, sort of symptomatic of something we're remembering. So back to this picture. So here's the, the idea of us moving. I couldn't work out how to, to do this line other than with these arrows. Um, but, you know, we can move from the window of tolerance down into fight and flight, and then we can end up in the freeze zone. And then, you know, we can start to mobilize more and then come back up into the window of tolerance. And um, let me just see. Yeah, I mean, one thing you can do and it can be very useful is to actually track this. And I may say this again later, I can't remember, but but actually in life I've done worked with clients with this and actually they've tracked themselves over a day and say, actually, I woke up in the window of tolerance, but actually, you know, well, maybe somebody wakes up and thinks, oh, my goodness, I'm late for work. They're going to go into the, the hyper arousal zone. I might lose my job. And then, you know, if if they have interjects about how stupid they are, they might think, oh, well, there's no point going to work because I'll only get sacked anyway. And then then they might think, oh, well, that's really not needed or necessary. They're not going to sack me. I can come back up and then I can come back. OK, maybe I'm OK. I'll just go in. I'll say I'm sorry I was late and go into work. OK, that's a non-trauma related sort of picture of how one can dip down into this and of course with trauma this can be very it can we can be up and down with this and um, it can be quite grounding to to follow that and the other thing I was thinking is that you know when we're triggered we can easily return back to old patterns of coping and you know, one may be becoming overly busy or withdrawing from friendships, and that could be happening now for people, uh, of becoming very exhausted, of trying to cope and trying to make sense of what's happening and not really being able to because they haven't recognised it's a trigger. So I hope you're following this. Uh, I know there's a lot um, here. It's being recorded, so you can listen again if you need to go back over stuff. But when we're feeling safe or in the window of tolerance, um, so I think the trauma recovery work is around processing our thoughts, feelings, sensations enough to return to the window of tolerance or that safe enough zone. And it helps to accept the fact that we're likely to trigger. So I've come to the conclusion in my life, and I'm, what, 25 years and more away from being in the cold, and I still just accept I will get triggered sometimes, and I do. Very occasionally now, I used to get triggered, I think, all the time, and I didn't even know I was triggered all the time. But... Um, I think it's just being matter of fact about it down to earth and think actually you know that's very likely to happen and you know it's not comfortable it feels horrible but it is a relief when you think actually this is just a, a trigger and just a memory and this isn't actually a danger in the present so how do we get back into the window of tolerance well I'm going to talk you through about grounding and we ground ourselves 
Now, we need relationships that, that, uh, that care for us, uh, people, sorry, that care for us and can help us too. But sometimes that isn't possible. And at the moment, that's really difficult because people can't have contact with each other. So I'm hoping these will help. So the first thing is practice self-compassion. So there's actually a, a course on self-compassion. Now, I don't know, I can't recommend it because I, I don't know the content of the course, but it sounds like a great idea that learning to have self-compassion is treating ourselves with the same kindness and understanding we'd offer to others when they suffer, fail, or feel inadequate. This is really important. If we have interjects about how stupid or sinful or whatever we are then we're likely to treat ourselves as harshly as the cult did and I think we really need it's really important to imagine maybe our dog or a child and think actually if they if that child or dog or vulnerable person actually did what i I've done how would I treat them and not to treat them harshly or as if they're stupid and that takes time I understand that um, I think we have to practice it we really do so I'm going to talk this is the final bit here there are quite a lot of slides but um, this is about grounding and so Ogden and Fisher are quoted here and sensory motor psychotherapy, which I partly drawn this theory from sensory motor psychotherapy and partly from polyvagal theory, which sounds weird, doesn't it? But it's just about the autonomic nervous system. Polyvagal mean is about that. But Ogden and Fisher, who I love their work, they, they say that grounding is an electrical current that indicates Grounding is an electrical term, sorry, that indicates an electric circuit is connected to the earth. Any leaking current of electricity is safely carried away into the ground where it can do no harm. So if you can see that picture of kind of rooting the energy down into the ground, not spooky energy or culty energy, just literally the, the physical energy of the trauma being into the ground. And I love this picture of a tree, so I borrowed it. Um, and I think the tree feels rooted and, uh, you know, and we can ground ourselves and root ourselves down into the ground. And um, so I'm going to give you a whole load. Probably what I'll do is give Ashlyn these slides and she can um, put them up under the, the talk, if that's possible, Ashlyn. I imagine you'll say yes. Yes, and then you can, yep. okay, <laughs> Thanks. And then you can um, have access to these because it'll be a bit much if I go through them all. But um, so uh, there are a few things I want to say is that many of these techniques can be done in any environment. So, you know, even I mean, we're not in public much at the moment, but they can be done in public and they do need practice. We need to kind of dedicate time to it. And practice does make perfect or certainly a lot easier, makes it easier over time. And I hope there's something or certainly a few things in the list you can use. And you can try and think of others or you probably already have others that you would use. So what I said earlier about tracking your nervous system, that's one thing you can do. And it can be very grounding. And as I said, I have done that with clients and I've done it myself. And so with grounding techniques, the ultimate goal is to heal the past. But for now, it can help to learn to live in the now and focus on the present when the past starts coming up. Now, I'm really aware that so many of us are in isolation, some are on our own. We can't, if you have people with you who you're safe with, turn to them. But, um, you know, but also practice these for yourself. So keep practicing. OK, so there's lots of ways we can ground ourselves. And this guy, Tull, and I, the reference is at the end of the slide. I, I didn't think it was worth reinventing the wheel because he really thought long and hard about a whole load of different grounding techniques. So I borrowed them from him. 
and I acknowledge that. And he said that we can use sound, touch, smell, taste, sight, and actual physical exercise, and then you may have other ideas. So some of the things, and I'll quickly go through them. It, so these are all for grounding, to bring you back in the present, and to recognize that actually, this is a memory, a symptom of a memory, it's not actually happening now. As I say, if it's happening now, then you need to do something about it. But this is if it isn't happening. So you can put your, put your favorite music on, talk out loud, um, can feel a bit weird, but you could get used to that. What do you see here brings you back into the room. Talk to a loved one. Put on some nature sounds. There's loads of stuff now online, isn't there? Nature songs, bird songs. Love the waves crashing. Read out loud. That can be very grounding. And with touch, they say, hold an ice cube and let it melt in your hand. One client of mine told me about that. So don't do anything that hurts you, okay? You put your hand under running water, cold water, not water that will burn you or hurt you take a hot or cold shower grab a piece of clothing that's comforting and you can snuggle up with it um and concentrate on what it feels like because that brings you into the present and then you can rub your hands lightly over the carpet you can pop bubble wrap that's fun isn't it massage your temples you know all these things with smell you can Sniff a strong peppermint or suck a strong pe peppermint. Probably typed that wrong, actually. Um, and I love lighting a scented candle. In fact, most evenings now I'm lighting a candle and putting a scent. I drop some lavender or something into the candle. And I find that really soothing. So the essential oils. Taste. Bite into a lemon. That will bring you back into the present. <laughs> suck on a mint. Take a bite of pepper or some hot salsa. Ooh, I didn't, don't remember I typed that. Um, chocolate, yeah, chocolate's very soothing, isn't it? And um, with sight, that's important. Keep your eyes open. Count the furniture around you. Put on your favourite movie. Whatever. And then others. You can take a mental inventory of everything around you such as the colours and patterns you see. Write in a journal. You know, journaling is really, can be very grounding. And, you know, keep a list of prompts or a list of some of these that really help you nearby because, you know, then you can remember them. Write a letter to some, an unsent letter. And then, you know, if you're on your own, no one's going to see. You can dance around, stretch your arms, you know, go, go for a walk or a run. Well, we're still able to do that in the UK. We're slightly afraid that might be taken away. I know people who aren't allowed out over the week, Easter weekend uh, in other countries. You can, I'll, I'll send this through to you, as I say. And... You know, so when there's no one there to soothe us, those who've been shunned know this feeling very well. And many others are experiencing this. So draw on these ideas in the grounding technique. And remember, this is going to pass. It will pass. And, you know, but it's going to take a while, I'm afraid. So breathe into the time you have that, that you're having to endure. Everyone's feeling it. You're not alone in that but that doesn't mean it's not still hard for you. Please be kind to yourself. And the other thing I just want to say again, if you're actually unsafe and if you're in an abusive relationship, will you please ring the police or services that can help and support you in your country? In the UK, I gather there's some hotels that have been open specially for people who are in domestic abuse and so they have somewhere to go. The other thing is, and this is the last thing, is trauma is catching, just like the virus is catching. I don't know if you knew that, but I know that as a therapist, that if I work with extreme trauma, sometimes I really feel the impact of it after the session. And I have to 
really look after myself. And we're all hearing these terrible things all the time at the moment. And that kind of captures this level of trauma. So please take very good care of yourself, especially if you're trying to cope with yourself and others, children, whatever. And maybe only listen to the news as and when you need to. And keep connected to others. Don't cut yourself off. Zoom, Skype, you know, have a plan to lessen your anxiety. Get a structure in your day. Get dressed, maybe. I, now, sometimes I, I love to just sit in my pajamas and, and I will, I'm inclined to sit all morning, but I do feel better when I actually have a shower and get dressed. Um, but sometimes it's nice just to stay in my pajamas. So, you know, but whatever. And know when to seek professional help. There's lots of therapists working online and, you know, that, that isn't a reason not to get help. And, you know, the thing about finding it hard to settle on something or finding that you can't concentrate is trauma related. And, and it's, it's an exhausting time. Even if you're doing nothing, it's exhausting because it's so traumatic. And there's a great um, article that my daughter sent through to me yesterday. And this woman just saying, don't be pressured by having to achieve at this time just because you have time on your hands. She was actually refuting this idea of, of if you haven't come through this thing with, you know, like all these new trainings in your life, then you definitely haven't used the time properly. And I, I don't think, you know, that's really um, something to challenge. And the, the final word is recovery actually doesn't mean we never trigger off. It means we make sense of and move out of the trigger more quickly. And there's lots more I could say about that. But I learned that when I did my PhD. And, you know, recovery means we understand and have compassion for ourselves, probably, and probably a lot of other things. So thank you for attending. Remember, recovery from cultic and spiritual trauma is possible. And with that, I will finish. Yay, thank you so much, Jilly. Um, if you wanted to end your screen share, the both of us could come up um, a little bit bigger for people to see. So I will do that. Yep. I go up to the top of the screen. Uh-huh. And then there should Pause be like share. Pause share. Stop share. Stop share. Yeah. Stop share. Da -da. Here we are. Yay. There you are. Great. Thank you. Now is a great time to submit Q&A. We've already had some great questions come through that I'll read to Jilly at this time. Um, but we've had, um, there's over 50 people who joined this webinar this morning. Really? So, yes, over 50, which is, Hi, guys. we Go. started with like 20 and then I just, it, we've been over 50 consistently. So, you know, with how many people there are, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, but if not, if we run out of time, please email me, Ashlyn, at mail at icsamail.com, and I can forward those questions to Jilly and vice versa. So we, could, we can figure out how to answer those questions yeah. and get them to you. We could do another session. I'm really happy mm -hmm. to just do an answering questions session or great. something. Yeah, and we could just have a Q&A session. That's a great yeah. idea. And yeah. one that Ryan and I've been talking about because the questions have been so good. Um, mm. Thank you for your presentation. It was excellent, so excellent, and so applicable to um, to our current times. And I loved how relevant it all was. Um, I loved your last comment where you talked about not feeling like a failure for not taking advantage of the time that we have. Um, that's something that you know, me coming from a high control group, it's almost like well. You know, I have to constantly keep doing something or improving myself or, but it's, it's a really hard time for people. And I think cutting ourselves some slack in that regard is um, healthy. So I'll begin with some of the questions here. Um, let's see. What would you say? I get on to them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is like our lightning round. <laughs> um, Someone asked, what would you say to those of us who grew up in a cult with reference to the cult personality that overlays the authentic self? What I would say is look for 
look for the things that made you different within the group. Um, one of my participants in my PhD, she said, w you look for the kernels, like the seeds of what, what is, what was you, what was you, what can you really identify as, as you, as opposed to somebody else? And it could be a really small thing, something like uh, I could paint well and other people couldn't. And um, it seems a small thing. But actually finding the small things is a big thing and building on that. And another wonderful uh, SGA who, um, Gina, Katina, my friend, she says to, so she's an SGA and she really knows about this stuff. And she said, find what you love to do. Like I love doing therapy and I'm loving the training and I love thinking through these things and that's me finding my authentic identity so I don't know if that is helpful but that's one thing thank you someone else asked is it possible that an individual's resilience is influential on whether what happens to them is trauma with a big t or a small t well, I think in my understanding of big T trauma is more to do with the actual trauma itself rather than um, if I'm understanding the question right. Um, I, I think the trauma, just repeat the question, will you? Mm -hmm. Is it possible that an individual's resilience is influential on whether what happens to them is trauma with a big T or a small T? Okay. I think that PTSD is a result of either big T trauma or small T trauma or both. So I don't think it's, it's not exactly the resilience isn't exactly um, because of one or the other. I think that um, the resilience is in our response to either or both. And um, yeah, I don't know if that's clear. I think it's slight, I haven't communicated very, very clearly that the big T and small T trauma is about the trauma, not about the individual. It's about the type of trauma, not about the response in that individual. Someone said, in the cult I came from, we were in constant fear of correction, yeah. which was always giving publicly. Wow. My stomach still clutches in anxiety about either being wrong or what people think of me. I have learned to recognize it and in managing it, but the reaction is still there after being 10 years out. Yeah. Well, you know, I really, I really can relate to that. You know, I can really feel it and I'm really sorry that you feel that. And I think it's, it really is about keeping grounded remembering that actually you know really holding it remembering this is a trigger it's a pattern match it's it's a pattern match it's a trigger and being really kind to yourself in accepting that actually 10 years isn't that long you know um mm -hmm. these things sit in our body not in a time in time they don't sit in time trauma has a whole different scale of time and so I would say you're doing incredibly well to just do what I, I said about being down to earth about it and say, oh, okay, it's, it's a trigger. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's helpful. But I'd, I, like, I'd like to say that anyone who does submit questions like that, that are so heartbreaking and yeah. provide a window into what you've been feeling and experiencing. Yeah. Thank you for your vulnerability and sharing. Yeah. Um, I think that's, it's really important and um, really courageous of you to share. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Someone else asked, do you think the freeze submit zone is recognized enough? 
that is what I lived in for years and I don't hear it spoken of much. You know, I don't think it is recognized enough. And I think um, polybagel theory, which um, is relatively new to trauma theory, actually was what brought, really started to show that scientifically, and I don't mean that in pseudoscience or weird silly stuff, I think truly recognizing that one of the, the nerves in the parasympathetic nervous system is actually responsible for us going into this extreme danger response of freeze. And I was surprised to hear the writers saying that it hadn't been acknowledged enough. Now, I worked at a rape crisis center for 11 years, and I recogn we recognized way back, I mean, this was like 25 years ago, that women in that situation would often freeze, and they would wonder why they hadn't activated or done anything about it, and then feeling really uh, guilty and beating themselves up about it and hadn't realized. And we would say to them then, we'd say, actually, that's your body making a, um, the neuroception, making um, a, a decision unconsciously that you are safer to freeze than you are to actually fight. You, and you wouldn't ever be able to go into the window of tolerance in that setting. So, um, yeah, and hopefully people will learn more about it. And, you know. Um, someone commented, Kristen Neff's self-compassion training and books are awesome. I can oh, highly awesome. recommend. Great. Good yeah. recommendation then. Thank you. Yeah, and that's Kristen Neff's with an N, Neff's. And I put a link on the PowerPoint. I didn't oh, show great. it. Great. Oh, Wonderful. Okay. okay. Someone asked, could we say that the window of tolerance could be the therapy room? Yes hopefully i mean if so when i'm working with clients former cult members the my main aim is to work in the window of tolerance so if someone doesn't feel safe with me safe enough with me if they don't like me if they don't think our whole confidentiality well they shouldn't come and see me anyway and um, it's not going to work because they can't think and feel at the same time. They can't process the, the emotions. So if, like the client who came in with the, the pillow and the tassel, the mm. cushion, I saw immediately they, they, li they literally froze. I mean, not everyone literally freezes. Sometimes in, a, in the counseling, you can see someone kind of slump or they'll lose concentrate like they'll lose their eyes will glaze over and it's like okay what's happening something's yeah. happening they're not here anymore because they need to know i'm there alongside them and supporting them yeah that makes sense mm -hmm. cool. and it, i think it's i think it's cool that um you pointed out something is so simple like a pillow because that's exactly what could do it? You know, sometimes people, people who aren't um, or haven't experienced maybe what former cult survivors have experienced may not recognize that even the little things like that could be triggers and people not even realize it. Um, and this person had been in a new age group where mm -hmm. the, the meeting room had all these beautiful colored fabrics and crystals. So if a therapist has a crystal in their room, that can be it. Mm -hmm. And I have heard some therapists refusing to remove things from the room, which, you know, you just shouldn't be seeing that therapist. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's not kind, it's not compassionate, and it, it's unnecessary. And, um, you know, uh, that makes me angry. Actually. Yeah. yeah. Just a few comments here. Someone said, hi, I am a trained teacher, yeah. trained by... Germer and Neff, and I love teaching self-compassion. It oh. is a nine-week course. I am doing it on Zoom, and another one starts next week. It's oh. superb. Great. Fantastic. Thank you for oh, sharing. That's amazing. Someone else said, um, let's see here. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Jilly. Oh. 
someone said yes thank you dr martin would have loved this oh really Yay. Yeah. Someone that said, how did ICSA become a safe enough place organization for you? I think that's a great question. For me? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really interesting. So, I'll tell you a story if you have time. Go for uh, it. I hope Michael Langoni's not listening. I don't think he is, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep it to ourselves, right? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, I, the first ICSA uh, conference I went to was in 1998 and it was in Chicago and I was training in a diploma in pastoral counseling way back then mm -hmm. and some people on the course decided to help fund me to go because they were supportive of me doing this cult recovery work which was really touching and I went along and Michael had a so I knew nobody. I was scared stiff. I mean, I'd been training. I'd come out of a cult four years earlier. I had two children at home and, and my husband, and I went off on this adventure on my own. And I flew to Chicago. And I, I mean, I grew up in Africa, so I'd flown a lot. So it wasn't the flying. It was the going and seeing all these people talking about cults and probably yeah. triggering off every left right and center yeah. and um and and michael had a like there was a room that if you wanted to go and talk to michael about certain mental health issues of working with clients and stuff you could go and speak to michael <laughs> i was so scared i was so scared i was like Oh, but I desperately wanted to learn more. So it was nothing to do with Michael, but it, it's funny. And then, and so I felt very unsafe when I was there because I didn't know anyone. I didn't have any way of, of connecting to anyone. And that's when I heard Dr. Paul Martin speak from, he was from Wellspring Retreat Center. And I heard him speak and he was so angry about how the churches were teaching former cult members that actually the answer to their cult problem was just to go to their church and he was so mad and I couldn't believe that somebody would be so able to speak out so passionately and angrily and so after that I contacted him and it was the next year, I actually went to Wellspring as an intern and met him and Ron Burks and the other people there. And that's when I started to feel safe. I suppose I felt safe with Dr. Paul Martin. He's sadly passed away many years ago now. Um, but he became a mentor to me. And then I got to know Michael and I love Michael. And, you know, he's um, realized, you know, it wasn't that scary and gradually have become more at ease with it. Yeah. My first ICSA conference, I didn't know anybody. I was presenting and that was another level of, I guess, oh. stress. and I had never been to like a cult and I'm a former member. So it was like, there was a lot. So I understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, and I'm so thankful that you were able to make those connections. So hopefully that answered your question, whoever. Yes, I thought it was a great question. Now, sorry to interrupt you so you know? many more. I mean, it's a, ICSA's really become my, my home in this field. And mm -hmm. I've made such wonderful friends, you included, Ashlyn, mm -hmm. and, you know, Pat, and, you know, just Lorna Goldberg, Dan Shaw, you know, people who I all, I regard as friends and a resource and a network. It's been amazing, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your yeah. kind words. Um, someone left this comment and I love, absolutely love this comment. They said, writing from New York City, oh. I just wanted to share that one thing I find immensely grounding and therapeutic is joining the 7 p.m two minutes of applause for the healthcare workers and those on the front lines of getting us through this pandemic. We lean out of windows and applaud or cheer or make a bit of noise with pots and pans. It brings us together 
It seems to make it real, but at the same time, being able to participate in a positive way with the schedule. I yep. love that comment. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing. It, that is a lovely sentiment. And I've never, I never quite thought of it as a grounding activity, but it is. It absolutely is. Lovely. Someone asked, um, out of curiosity, do you know of any listing, exhaustive um, listing of the symptoms or words or metaphors describing the pseudo personality? Uh, no, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. Um, I, I wrote an article actually in 2008 for ICSA, um, which is on the website if that's any use. You know, and I think it's a really useful idea. Not everyone runs with that idea, but I, I personally use it in the therapy as the kind of um, it's the kind of base to my thinking that we're actually unlayering the pseudo identity. We're actually finding the authentic identity. And if you look at like uh, asphalt or tarmac, as we call it, you know, and when tarmac breaks up and the plant starts to grow through, this is how I see it, that the tarmac starts to break up and the authentic identity breaks through and we start to blossom. And, and that's definitely happened to me. I mean, uh, and we can trigger into the pseudo identity and, and my pseudo identity, because I was also in a Bible based group. So I had to be very nice. I'm sure any of you who've been in Bible based groups, Will know what I mean about having to be very nice and um, you know nice and how are you and you know oh you can't be angry and you've got to be well. and uh, I remember once meeting someone from the church we were in that we'd left maybe five years before and I was so shocked to see them that <laughs> instead of kind of just saying hi and walking on I, I stopped and I went oh how are you and my husband standing next to me, he went, oh, can you talk to us? Went, what was that? <laughs> I thought, I know what that was. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was a trigger and it, it, it's like this pseudo self came out, you know, anyway, that was funny. That is funny. <laughs> um, someone asked, hi, Jilly, I suffer hi. from CPTSD and panic disorders every day now for 25 years as a result of 10 years of abuse in the cult. Nothing triggers it. It is always a part of me. I just live with it. Mm -hmm. The current COVID-19 doesn't make me anxious at all. I've tried all the psychologists, psychiatrics, meds, alcohol, but nothing. Xanax helps with it. It's like the complex anxiety is tattooed into my body and soul. Wow. Any suggestions how to live with it? I feel that they stole my life and they did. How does one recover and heal from that when you live with PTSD every day? Oh, I'm really sorry. That's that. It's, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, and that you, you live with that. I mean... Okay, if so, how I, I formulate this as um, someone who works with former cult members. Now, I, you're saying that you're not triggered. I, I, I mean, it's I can't say because you know what you're saying is is what you you feel a, about your situation. But I I would question that. Put it like that. I would question that. And um, this thing of it being in the DNA, I'm assuming your first generation, um, you were in for 10 years. Um, I, I don't know if you left at 10 or, you know, I think there's a difference between, I think second generation or those born and raised often do feel like it's in the DNA. And I think first generation sometimes can feel that too, because it goes so deep. If I, if I was, and I'm not suggesting I do, but I'm just saying the way that I work would be to take you through a whole, all these areas of um, the, the postcard counseling, the psychoeducational 
aspect so we unlayer the pseudo identity and it may be that the pseudo identity is is the the ptsd you know is, is what your identity has become as a result of this terrible experience i i don't know i'm guessing into thin air here because i don't know you but i if if um i, I think uh i've seen working with people how they have been really really st strongly in ptsd complex ptsd how they've been really pretty well psychotic because of the belief systems that the really terrible things that we believe about ourselves in those settings and i'm talking really extreme things here and and actually working through that i have a workbook that i work through with clients and we go through one step at a time slowly but surely and we literally go through all the different psychoeducational areas i mentioned the pieces of the jigsaw and gradually slowly but surely we start to unlayer the, this identity and actually start to get a real sense of um actually this belonged to the cult and this belongs to me so we're kind of separating me from the cult and that i'm no longer that person so and um, thought reform is the beating heart of of the work that i do it dr paul martin's thought reform model was shown to be exceptionally helpful to former cult members and i've um, develop my own version of the wellspring model because I don't have a center I work from my well now from my Skype but um, but from my therapy room at home but who what however I work we go through all the psychoeducation so you start to really understand this is what they did to me this is why I've ended up in this place I hope that makes sense thank you um someone mentioned let's see here is this an example of an introject when people were kicked out of the cult i was in including myself the leader told us that if we told anyone about what went on in the cult we would come back in our next life as a quark i don't a know what hawk. that means. a hawk a hawk maybe yeah uh it's it's q u a r k quark uh, oh, oh that'll be a yeah cool that's like quantum physics or something isn't it oh hmm. like a little thing oh. yeah is that well, an, an interject is what yeah. they're asking yeah. yeah it's a very good example yeah. of an interject i mean you know it with interject one could have actually one could almost i'm sorry it's a very serious issue but we do need some humor as well actually that um you know you could like they're ridiculous you know really it's mm. like ugh. i i believed that <laughs> my cult leader was i i was told by my cult leader that james bond was the ideal christian man okay now uh -huh. make sense of that and we interjected it I, I know it's not quite such a terrifying interject as the one of coming back as a court but it is an interject and it really needs chewing over and and really reducing to the ridiculous idea that it is if i'm allowed to say that mm -hmm. someone um asked i i had a pretty significant triggering event with my family recently leading to a huge fight my family has not processed together the fact is that my sister and i being in a cult i left in 2001 she in 2013 in order to heal from this recent triggering event, I feel some discussion needs to happen, at least between my sister and I. But I don't want to trigger her or my elderly parents by talking about this right now. Given the overall context of fear and intensity right now, any advice? We are no longer living together, um, which we were because of COVID. I'm on my own. Oh. I mean, without knowing all the, like, the ins and outs. Yeah. I mean, one thing you could try is try, like, and say what they call an unsent letter or just sort of 
experiment with your for yourself with what what might I be able what 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 do I want to say and and then you know think what might the consequences be and I you know I think it's really difficult you know the the, the issue between first and second generation and that is those who joined and those who are born and raised and um the the difficult conversations that need to happen mm -hmm. and the real reluctance of children not wanting to upset their parents and you know i i had children after i left the cult but I still was in the cult mindset. And so I've had to have some conversations um, which have been welcomed by me because I understood that those difficult conversations had to happen. And I suppose what I'm saying is there's a balance between um, like speaking difficult truths and and healing them because you know we're just avoiding them otherwise and then also you know kind of can they hear what i have to say so you could experiment with how might i say it and it could an unsent letter gives an opportunity to get it off your chest anyway onto a piece of paper and then you can experiment with actually might might i have some other ideas i don't know if that's any use well it's a tough i mean not that it's ever an easy time to talk with family about exactly. issues, but this is a really tough yeah. time yeah. to yeah. try to navigate all that. Um, and so I, you know, I, I feel for anyone in that position. Thank you for sharing. But I think, I don't know about you, there's also that feeling of danger, isn't there, of, of actually, do I need to say what I want to say right. uh, and I right. don't put pressure but yeah. there's that feeling inside me as we're talking about this of is this something I need to do um, because of the situation we're in as well so um, yeah I, and you know people getting a bit cross and it's normal and natural and you know so um, I wouldn't be afraid of it it's just making it as constructive as possible. And said, do you have any advice for dealing with the sense of isolation from other people that results from experiencing a trauma that you feel that you can't talk about with most people? When does it help to talk to people in one's life about a past cult trauma? Or how can you tell when it's helpful to talk to others when it is not? Um, kind of sounds like they're coming from, you know, when is it appropriate to discuss these things when is it not um especially related to trauma exactly well you do need to feel safe enough with whoever you speak to and let your neuroception let your gut feeling let your sense of is this person safe to speak to and or not and then you know as i said if the the isolation is triggering off the memories and the whole experience of being uh, whatever that trauma was, then really see if you can use some of the grounding techniques. Find one or two that help you. Have a hot bath, whatever. You know, you'll know of things that that you've worked out that do help a bit. And and you know, healthy neuroception is also able to to tell who who is safe or who is safe enough. And within ICSA. There are a number of therapists who are really safe enough. They really are. There's people, you know, you could email Ashlyn, she can suggest people. Um, everybody's had to go online now, so you can't speak yeah. to people locally. Yeah. But there are people, and people are being very generous at the moment and offering at low cost or yes. whatever. So, you know. And I'm happy to have an email with Ashlyn about that. Um, uh, not for me. I'm not talking about seeing me. I'm talking about, you know, others around. Yes. Thank you for mentioning that as well. Um, 
Someone said, Dear Jilly, I am always encouraged by your kindness and empathetic approach. I am finding that a lack of external focus is very disorienting at this time. It takes me back to developmental unmet needs in the homeschool cult where I was born and raised. Even something as simple as a to-do list is triggering because of the inward focus. I try to create work around structures to create pathways around triggering things like my to-do list. Creativity has been helpful. How can I know if it is a good time to work on my development needs and identity? Are creative approaches a good idea? Wow. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> For my side, definitely creative approaches. And try, if, if focusing and making lists and stuff doesn't work for you, see if you can be really creative and find other ways of doing it. Um, if it's a massive trigger, um, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but, you know, like, you know, I, I, I'm always thinking I should make lists and do things on certain days, and I never do because I actually hate it. <laughs> but I do get them done, and I expect you get them done too, and maybe that's just not the way you are. So it could be a trigger, and it can also be a personality thing or a preference. So I don't know if that even begins to answer the question, but... Yeah. Um, and, and thank you for what you said. That was very sweet. And it's very, it is a very kind comment. Yes. Yeah. Uh, someone said, I'm not a therapist at all, uh, just FYI. Um, but someone may want to consider looking into somatic therapies, which as I understand, it deals with the mind body aspect of trauma, yeah. how trauma is trapped in the body. Also, an interesting book I've read is Healing Developmental Trauma, How Early Trauma Affects Self by LaPierre and Heller. Yeah. Thank you for providing that resource. Um, someone else suggested Richard Grannon suggests rather than CPTS disorder, considering a linguistic shift towards CPTS response, we can heal. Nice. Another encouraging comment. Thank you. And I, I always love how um, the attendees, whenever, you know, either if we're doing chat or Q&A, um, people are really supportive of each other um, and are sending resources back and forth. And I just wanted That's to highlight lovely. that. Yeah. And somatic therapy. Yes. Yeah. There's a number now of, of somatic. Sensory motor is somatic. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Levine, um, you know, Van, Bessel van der Kolk. There's stuff online. I think I've put some, um, a few resources. Uh, yeah, there's a few resources on this slide that I didn't show you. There were a, there are a few after my thank you slide. Janina Fisher, Carolyn Spring, Matthew Tull, uh, a couple of books. So yeah. And we could send an email of all these resources even um, to everybody. And if yeah. you wanted to share your PowerPoint, just like we did last time, yeah. um, we can share with whoever joined yeah. our call today. That would be um, fine. Let's see. Someone said, can you speak a little more about hot rage and how we use it to defend ourselves? Can it develop in childhood or adolescence? Okay. Um, well, it can be very early. It's from a, an early developmental stage, uh, hot rage. But, um, and there's a lot to say about it. And this other resource of, I mentioned, Sue Parker Hall, uh, my colleague and friend, we're, we're co-training um, eight former cult members in the post-cult counselling model that I've developed. And, um, She's written a book called Anger, Rage and Relationship, as I mentioned, and she says a lot about the difference between healthy anger and hot and cold rage. It's definitely worth looking at for former members. It's not targeted at former members, but she looks at the developmental issues around it. So uh, I, I'm not going to say much more about that, but hot rage is something that uh, we think of, she's she thinks of rage as a defense against impact. So, you know, when, 
when a trauma, when something abusive happens, we have to defend against that in some way. And it's when we're out of the window of tolerance and we're overwhelmed. So we can either hot rage or cold rage. So hot rage is out against the other person, trying to defend ourselves and doing the best we can. Yeah. And cold rage is really turned against ourselves and it can be self-harm. Negative introjects are cold rage. It's like, I'm horrible, I'm sinful. When I left the group, I believed I was toxic, literally would harm people if they were in my presence, you know, nearly psychotic idea. And that sort of cold rage of just um, suicidal thoughts, that sort of thing is cold rage. So it's really worth understanding uh, the theory. I, I find it really helpful. Sue Parker Hall actually commented, she said, non-therapists start reading my book at chapter four, otherwise you may be put off. <laughs> Thank you for that, Sue. I appreciate it. <laughs> Clarification. Yeah. Um, we only have enough time for just a few more questions here, so we'll try to get through these really quickly. Someone just said, exponential gratitude for your work. This is so healing. Thank you. That's so, thank you. That means the world to me. Yes. I'm, I'm trying to read you. all these positive comments because I want you to know how much people are appreciating um, your talk. Someone asked, um, does hallucinogenics help with trauma recovery? Wow. Now there's a subject. That's a big question. <laughs> But and one I've looked into actually, mm -hmm. because, and I'll say a little bit around this, I'm not going to give you necessarily a definitive answer because it, I'm not a, an expert on this. Um, but I think the danger for, for going into that territory with former cult members is that some people have had terrible experiences on drugs in cults. And I've worked with people who were given LSD and, and MDMA mm. at the same time in therapy groups and subjected yeah. to thought reform and an abusive cult leader uh, controlling their lives. And it takes, it's such a, a process to actually recover from that because so much is at a distance you know, in that person's psyche, because so much of the, the control and the abuse has happened while they've been in that altered state of consciousness. So I'm really uh, wary uh, about the whole subject, but I think trying to be balanced and say that things that happen within a cult, like therapy happens in cults, and it's done in a harmful way and therapy happens in obviously in other settings and it's done well and everything can be not, not wanting to become black and white in my thinking that there, there is scientific no there's there are experiments that have been going on certainly in the UK at the uh, Imperial College Hospital actually taking trauma survivors through um, a, a journey on side of Cybin, which a journey is a very structured um, taking of the drug or the medicine. Um, and there was some evidence that there was short term help with depression i think the psilocybin was with depression and i think there are experiments happening with mdma and ptsd now i may not going on in canada right now actually so those experimental trials yeah oh. so it's happening all over the world and i had a look at um I can't remember his name now, guys. So I have looked into it. I was going to do a talk for ICSA in Manchester, but it, it didn't work out. But um, ooh, I, I just find, I find it dangerous. I think if you have a guide or a shaman or a psychologist who's taking you through that journey and they're good people and they're ethical, 
and they're safe and you have ways of checking them out, then maybe it's, it's going to be okay. But I would have a massive health warning on the whole thing, particularly for ex-cult members, because mm. I... I personally would never, I, now others do use hypnotism, but I'm not a hypnotist, but I, I actually think we need a very grounded understanding, using our faculties to help ourselves to recover uh, from the cult experience, and that altered states of consciousness from any angle m may be a trigger in themselves. Yeah, thank you, and it is such a big topic. Um, we can certainly devote a whole you know talk or session on just that topic um so Probably let's not with me because i don't know enough about yeah. it <laughs> that's okay <laughs> that is all right um because yeah. we still have a lot of questions coming in um i'm gonna please email me um ashlyn at icsa um mail and it's actually in the chat uh pat ryan just threw it in the chat my email and ix's email um, please reach out to me with your remaining questions. If I didn't get to your question, I'm really sorry. We just we had over 50 people viewing. And so we just, we've, I think we've gotten through 22 questions today, um, but they keep coming in. So thank you everyone who's been asking questions. I wanna be sure and get to those and I'll send them to Jilly. Um, someone asked, will I be able to access this presentation today? Um, the answer is yes. Um, I am hoping to get all the recordings of this virtual event series on ICSA's YouTube channel um, by the end of April, uh, everything up until this point. Um, and that's my goal. Um, and so only with speaker's permission, of course, um, they give me their permission, I will put all these recordings on YouTube. I will also, Jillian and I will brainstorm some resources. I'll send an email out to everybody in this group um, who watch today of her um, PowerPoint, if you wanted to share your PowerPoint. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to share it with the people who've been right. And I'm happy to do, you know, I only, I'll do this if it's helpful. I, I'll carry on with what I'm doing. You know, I've got other things I can do. So I, you know, if, if it would be useful, I'm happy to do a follow up with the people who've been here. Yeah. Let's say, let's have some more Q&A. We need just need a Q&A session. I think that's yeah. a great idea. Um, and we could certainly schedule you in because the questions have been so good. Thank you everyone who's submitted questions, who've shared such vulnerable experiences. Um, we, you know, we so appreciate you sharing and um, tuning in today and talking to Jilly and I. Um, and I, I wanted to let everyone know if you would like a free ICSA web membership, um, email me and I'll be sure and get you guys one. Um, times are tough financially and we just wanna make sure you guys have all the help you need and resources. Um, and tomorrow is Joe Zimhart at um, noon, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern time, US Eastern time. And he is talking about, I put his entire um, kind of summary in the chat function, but it's about um, recovery and um, new age and the new age. And it should be very, very good. So please, if you are able, um, I'm excited to have a conversation with Joe. So um, with that being said, thank you, Jilly. Um, you're incredible as always. You've, I mean, you've spent almost an hour and a half with us or hour 45 with us this morning. And I just, I really appreciate you and everybody's so grateful. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And please stay safe. You too. And thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone stay safe out there. Email me if you need access to anything. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'll leave the meeting.